It is my pleasure to introduce you to somebody you all know. You may not know him personally, but I think there isn't a person on this planet who doesn't know Michael York. He is obviously one of the most talented and acclaimed actors of our time. And he's brought all of us in this room and all of us over the world so much pleasure. His range is absolutely incredible. As an actor, Michael, I think you can do anything. And so I'm not going to list all of his credits. I'm just going to list some of my favorites. So just remember Michael in Cabaret. Yay is right. <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. Yay. Logan's Run, which we made when I was at MGM. Murder on the Orient Express and Austin Powers. <laughs> but what most of you don't know is what a privilege it is to have Michael as a friend. Michael is a loyal, funny, and intelligent friend. He gives 100% to everything that he does, and he gives 100% to all of his friendships. There's an old saying, you know, who would you go in the trenches with? If you only had a quarter, who would you call? And Michael is the person that I always think all of us would call. So it wasn't surprising to me that when he was struck with this dreaded, dreaded disease, that he would bring those same traits to fighting it. We all know, as the doctor told us, what the disorder is and that it is an orphan disease. So it's really never had a voice. It's really never had a public face. But because of Michael, it now has a voice. It now has an advocate that can reach millions of people. Michael's honesty and his willingness to go public with the struggles that he's faced, he often says, is his most important role and the most important thing that he feels that he is doing in his life. Michael's going to tell you about his journey, but before I bring him forward, there's another person who has shared every single step of that journey, and she deserves credit as well, and that is his loving wife, Pat, who is an incredible talent in her own way, but is the most supportive and loving wife that anyone can ever have. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to someone I truly love, not because he's a giant talent, but because he has the biggest heart in the whole world, Michael York. Sherry, thank you for that. I think it's called an encomium. Um, would that I could live up to it. And now that I have the microphone, thank you for all you do um, in this wonderful philanthropic part of your life. Bless you. Um, yes, you mentioned Logan's Run. We met on the set <laughs> in the early 70s. Uh, it was a futuristic film set in the future where these people had these life clocks which let them know when their time was you know, up and they had to give it up. They lived in this wonderful, fantastic society, but that was the thing. You had, at the age of 30, off you went. And some, of course, there were a few snicks. But anyway, I'm happy to say that because of the work that you're all doing, my life clock is no longer blinking. <laughs> And um, I'm sincerely thrilled to be here to be an advocate for, uh, as Dr. Vescu has described, um, a strange, rare, frequently misdiagnosed malady um, that I would like to put a spotlight on and indeed have gone through a lot of what he was um, describing. Um, my condition manifested about th oh, three years ago, four years ago. I noticed my eyes were getting very dark, dark circles, and I thought, well, you know, age, whatever. And being an actor, I could slap makeup on, no one knew. But it gradually got worse and worse, and then um, I was uh, diagnosed with Fabry's disease, fatal, the first of many misdiagnoses. And um, fortunately, I uh, was sent 
you know, um, to uh, good hospitals where they found there was something definitely wrong, particularly with the light chains, which is a key marker. And um, at first, because it's so damn difficult to recognize that these terrible twins, multiple myeloma and amyloidosis, going hand in hand, um, one a cancer, the other not, but equally destructive. But I'd, for 40 years, I'd been a homeopath. I'd kept myself pretty healthy through the you know, homeopathic means. And uh, so the taking on of drugs was sort of against the system. Um, but eventually, uh, to cut a very long story, exploratory story, where I went down to Mexico and had great treatments, insights, seeing what was being done, and finding you know, that, that healing was so multifaceted. And, uh, but I found myself with Bob Vessio at Cedars. We were being treated uh, for multiple myeloma, but with this enormous, he was, the amyloidosis was there and where the balance lay. But I had the, Sherry has mentioned Pat, my wife, who indeed has been, she was so proactive in this. She knew, she researched it in one of the doctors, and she had this extraordinary correspondence with an, an amazing man, Dr. Robert Kyle at the Mayo Clinic, who is the godfather of both multiple myeloma and amyloidosis. And they corresponded and corresponded. Then Dr. Kyle said, well, you know, I think you should come here because it's the one thing we can do for you. We can give you a, a stem cell transplant. We've done it many times and I think it's pretty good. We're pretty good at it. And what attracted me to the mayor that you could go there as an outpatient, whereas at Cedars you had to go into the hospital, which I was always conditioned to, to understand was po possibly the most dangerous place you could go to. So I went to the Mayo, and they did everything that Bob Vessio described. They, you know, they, you get the injections that boost the amount of stem cells. You go in, they give you a week to harvest these. Fortunately, I got mine in a day and a half, where this machine hoovers them out. Then. Um, the next thing is, of course, the chemo, which kills everything. You have nothing. And the day after that, you go back, stem cells are put back, and the little darlings go to work rebuilding your immune system. And in fact, it's treated as a sort of birthday. July the 10th is my other birthday. And fortunately, I, um, I sailed through it. I had none of the problems that they predicted. I had a good appetite. and. Uh, you know, uh, I wasn't seriously inconvenienced. And then um, earlier this year, after you know being in inhibited from this, I was able to fly to travel. And most recently, in September, I was able to go back to England, where, besides taking part in a production of King Lear at the Old Vic, <laughs> which was a sort of affirmation. I went to the Royal Free Hospital up the hill in Hampstead, where the work of Sir Mark Pepys, again on amyloidosis, is very much in evidence. He has developed a scanning machine where you can actually go in, the machine scans you, it'll find out where the amyloid deposits are. Fortunately, they were not um, the stem cell transplant seems to have done its work. It's evident in, um, it's still in my tongue, which makes my speech a little strange. Uh, around the heart, sort of thickening of the heart, but nothing that worried them at all. In the spleen, they say, now it's time. But it was good to get a second opinion and to also to realize that this kind of work is being enormously advanced that uh, GlaxoSmithKline are in partnership with them to develop a drug. It's worked in mice. A little mouse, chock full of amyloid fibrils, was completely cleared by this experimental drug. It's now going into the human trials. 
I offered myself. They said, no, you don't have enough amyloid in you. So that was a, an affirmation. Um, but uh, while I was lo in London, I was interviewed by The Guardian, by Sarah Bosley, their leading award-winning uh, medical correspondent. And since then, I've become a sort of go-to guy. I'm thrilled about this. People are calling, emailing from all over the world saying, um, you know, thank you for becoming a spokesperson because we need it. Because and, I, and more and more, I had instances of people telling me, you know, that what happened was that, you know, they, they had the amyloid. Unfortunately, it was always, it was discovered too late. And the, the organs had been shut down and just too late. Tragic. So um, I'm so thrilled to hear what you were discussing because there's a real need out there and it works. I mean, I was surprised to hear that uh, Bob say the incidences were, what was it, two to five? Because I was told in France it's 30%, but that may have changed now because the amount of research, because um, I'm reading about it, it's happening all over the world, is ratcheting up at a tremendous pace. On Friday, I'm going in to, believe it or not, with this voice to lay down the narrative for a, a new film, documentary film about amyloidosis. Hopefully, we'll you know, carry on the job. But enough for me perorating. I just wondered if there's any um, uh, questions that, uh, yes, my dear. I remember um, you telling me how many misdiagnoses that you had. How long between when you noticed the deposits on your eye, which was the first thing, to when you, you, you found out what it was? Was it months? Was it? It was years. That's what I was. Yeah. It was years. Yeah. Meanwhile, it was getting worse and worse. I was feeling ill. Um, I had to stop doing things. Um, I could work a bit, but not very much. And uh, the stem cell transplant was last year. As you can see, the. Uh, <laughs> In a way, it was good. The amyloid was depositing mainly in the soft tissues around the eyes. I looked like a raccoon. It was quite scary. I mean, but at least I knew it was there. I knew something was up. It wasn't one of those silent deposits where they're shutting down vital organs. And um, so the stem cell transplant was due live last year. But, but I just want to say for all of us, and, and just to express it just you know how much how I feel about you, my enormous respect, but my enormous gratitude because Michael had these deposits for years, and the misdiagnosis that's out there is because nobody knows about this disease, and I, I just have to say this: uh, Michael is an actor; he's a public person, and to not to go public when the tabloids are writing, you know, that you have every other disease, whatever it is, and to not be afraid to come out in public when you were having this. And, and I just think your bravery and your integrity and your honesty will draw so much attention to this disease, and, and I know you will be cured, so I'm, you know, but it's just that I, I don't think we can ever ignore how brave this was, because I saw Michael for years during the process, and, and when you didn't know what it was, and were the victim of you know articles, whatever, and and couldn't work, you know. So now, thank God, that's behind you. But it is going to save someone else's lives who has deposits and says, "Well, I heard about what Michael said. Maybe that's what I have." And if you get it early, then you're okay. Well, thank you, Sherry. Yes, indeed, two uh, learned doctors in the Globe magazine reported on my um, plastic surgery because right. they saw the stitches. <laughs> and in fact, the journalist who reported this left her email and I said to her, my dear, I wrote to her and said, you must realize that what you've written is, is arrant nonsense, but I'm happy to supply we, you with the real reason of what happened because maybe you, you, know, you, can, you can raise awareness you can, because it is out there. But she wrote back a one-liner saying, um, glad you're feeling better, <laughs> or something <laughs> anodyne. So, um, Leon, but, you know, Leon, I, uh, Leon and then Alan. Here's a personal uh, reminiscence that you'll find intriguing. I was um, um, 
maybe uh, 15 years ago or so, Chairman of Medicine at University College London and the Royal Free Hospital. And I was trying to build the Royal Free Hospital's research profile in the most impressive way. So I recruited a chap from the, from the Hammersmith Hospital called Mark Pepys. And Mark Pepys just two years ago got knighted for his contributions to medical science. So, and as I was listening to you, I was saying to myself, I wonder if he knows Mark Pepys. Well, thank you, <laughs> because it was uh, Mark Pepys's work that um, you know enabled the uh, scanning machine and uh, all the. But how wonderfully perceptive of you, sir, to <laughs> to have picked on him because the work is zooming forward with enormous benefits in sight. Alan. So, so Michael, I, I, I don't know the, <coughs> the answer to this. I'm here. Where, oh, yes. I'm here. Hello. <laughs> I'd love to be in Just the spotlight the again. <laughs> I don't really know the answer to this, but there is no... Uh, no one else in the family, if you look back, uh, they w wouldn't have been diagnosed with it, perhaps, but anything like this? Is it any, any indication that it might have been in your family anywhere at all? No, um, the, the, as uh, Dr. Vessio said, there are about five categories of amyloidosis, AL being the most common one, but there is a familial one. There's also one that's right. close to uh, Alzheimer's. It's, uh, right. uh, again, it's, we're in the, uh, you know, it seems almost the beginnings of this mystery, but it's, on a daily basis, it's becoming more pronounced. But no, I'm an aberration. I don't know what right. it is. Uh, well, <laughs> but well, I'm going to find well, out. You're a wonderful aberration. But the, uh, <laughs> I mean, I've got so strong a memories of, of you in, in acting. But, the, um, but the, the, the thing that my thought is here is that we ought to collect um, cell samples, maybe blood samples from people like yourself, because... The new era in stem cells is to take those cells, turn them into what we call IPS cells, and try and study what might be different about the, the mechanisms in your genes that are folding the protein the wrong way and laying it in yes, the wrong shape. Yes, into fibrils. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, I, I'd encourage you strongly, and I'll encourage all the scientists strongly, to think about, you know, taking samples from people like you, just a blood sample, because uh, with these new technologies, we can go and interrogate that disease because what, one thing is it's familial. It may be familial, but it's just more difficult to recognise. And those, those genes which are sort of s switching or the pathways which are, which are not operating correctly, if we knew about it, you know, there may be new ways of developing drugs that could actually stop it for people like yourself in the future. So... Um, but I do feel that regenerative medicine is yeah. the future. Yeah. And, uh, and the most exciting thing on yeah. the horizon. So uh, I'm all for, you know, the, um, endorsing what you're doing. Uh, it's um, thrilling, philanthropic, and I think the future. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you.